Hi, welcome to SignalPad. In this episode, we're going to try and see if we can repair this on Ritsu MS9710A. Now, this is actually an instrument that I don't have in the lab, so if I can fix it, I'll keep it in the lab so we can do more experiments in the future. This is an optical spectrum analyzer. Now, I do have a wavelength meter, and a wavelength meter is a poor man's spectrum analyzer. And you've seen me use it before and repair and replace the helium neon laser in it. And uh, this particular unit goes from 0.6 to 1.75 micrometers of uh, wavelength of light coming in. So it's actually quite broadband, goes well beyond the infrared uh, wavelengths that are used for telecom. And it starts at visible 0.6 uh, or 600 nanometer is visible, that's red light. So we should be able to even try it with a regular laser. And as you can see, there's an optical input in the front. And you know it looks like it's in good shape otherwise, but it doesn't work. And uh, we want to find out what's going on with it. And if you can fix it, it will be great. And I'll show you the, the nice thing about this unit is that it's very small. Normally, optical spectrum analyzers are huge, uh, primarily because of the fact that a lot of them are based on free space optics. And that requires a, a basically an optical table to be built into the unit and it has a lot of moving parts and therefore it's extremely heavy. This one is also very heavy, but it's not very large. So we're gonna try it out. So I've plugged it in, let's see what happens if I turn it on. And that's all it does. Uh, the fan comes on, the screen changes a little bit, the backlight is very dim, I imagine that it's a CCFL also and it's aged quite a bit. And one time when I turned it on, I actually did get the logo, but it doesn't seem to advance beyond this point. So there's a couple of reasons why that could be, and we're going to open it up and see what happens. And it doesn't smell very, very good, so I suspect it has some failed components uh, at least. And uh, I have a feeling it could even be just a power supply problem and we just doesn't have enough voltage to boot. Uh, I don't know, we'll have to open it up and figure it out. So I'm eager to take a look inside of it. Let's get started. So I started taking the units apart and as you would imagine, it has a very nice frame that protects all the optical table components and all the optical table components are really hidden deep inside the unit. There is really not much you can see from all foreners, four corners of, of the instrument that I've taken apart. So right now we are looking at the bottom of it. We can see the bottom here that this is part of the floppy drive and the floppy connection to this main board here. It looks like it's some kind of a power distribution perhaps and it looks going by the look of it is plugging into some other motherboard where the main processor would certainly be on there and we would eventually have to reach that. And here is the cable that uh, most likely drives either the keyboard or the LCD screen. Uh, so, and there is a, here's the, the switch that goes in the front at the very bottom, that's the, the power switch, the mechanical power switch, reaches all the way back here, that's where the actual a switch is right next to where the power goes in. So the power supply would be somewhere deep in there. This is going to be a nightmare to reach. And uh, so yeah, this is not much really to look at on this side. A few connectors here. So let's go ahead and flip it so you can see the other side as well. And then we'll take it uh, one step at a time. And here is the top of the unit. All these cables that you see here go to the GPIB and serial interface it looks like. And maybe some other ones. There's too many cables here for just that. Or maybe I'm wrong. Uh, no, no, maybe. I uh, can't quite figure out exactly where these are going. I have to open it up a little bit more. Uh, there is uh, a printer here. <laughs> so it's got a, a, a thermal printer, and it's common for these spectrum analyzers, optical spectrum analyzers. A lot of them actually have this. So you put paper in there, and it'll print out your spectrum and so on. Anyway, nobody uses this anymore. And uh, some power distribution, some control circuitry for the printer is there. And uh, there is some other things here. I haven't taken a look at this. This block here has two fiber optics going in or going out of it. It, this actually, by the look of it, might be the calibration wavelength generator. So it has a solid state laser, it looks like, for the calibration signal, which is at the back of the unit. So we have to take, uh, take that apart further to see. And right here underneath, of course, is the optical bench table or optical table where everything is happening in there. So we'll have to uh, take a look at it a little bit more. Here I see some hinges. So it's clear that this is intended to be kind of open this way to reveal what's underneath it. If you look very carefully over here, I see huge capacitors. That's obviously where the power supply is going to be. So let's uh, keep going. And uh, there's a plate at the top. You can't see from where it is. Right at the top, top of the unit on this side, there's a plate. And that plate underneath it must have uh, some of the power supply components as well. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at that and then go from there. And here's looking at it from the side, and I just have the instrument sitting uh, kind of upright like this, and it's quite heavy, so it's difficult to keep moving it around. So underneath this plate is uh, most likely the power supply by the look of it. So what we were looking at was just uh, looking at this face front right there. This is the optical module I was talking about. Here's the printer. So 
there it is. Uh, and uh, underneath this, we have to have some of the components. Now there's some fiber running over this. We'll disconnect the fiber uh, with these Velcros. They're just held in place. And there's a couple of screws to remove that. And by the look of it, I see capacitors right through here. So we should be able to see the power supply. And we can see if there's anything obvious. I'm just thinking it could be that it maybe it doesn't have the right voltages, although you never know. All right, the screws are, are off. And let's see what we got here. Should be able to remove this plate and carefully not to damage it. And there is our power supply. There we go. It uh, looks nice. It's, I'm not sure which company has made that. Might be even be on Ritsu, although um, uh, I don't know. Sometimes the, the Japanese often like to build their own power supplies. And uh, maybe this is one of those ones. So anyway, uh, yeah, we can take a look and see what's going on. You can clearly see the various components of it are of our power transistors and everything are on the wall. There are big capacitors there. So if I can find a port where all the voltage is going in and out, we should be able to at least do some preliminary measurements. Now, just by the look of this, this is a, my goodness, the disassembly of this is uh, not easy. It's not the friendliest uh, instrument for service because, again, because it's so compact. So they've, they've gone through the trouble of making it very small, so which means it's obviously going to be difficult to service as a consequence. So I was further disassembling and I noticed that as I've been moving it around to try and to get to the power supply, sometimes when I turn it on, now it starts to show something on the screen. Now, of course, that I'm trying it on camera. Now it doesn't show anything anymore. But it looks like that it may have some intermittent problem. And uh, I'm not sure if it's entirely because of the power supply. But there's certainly something seriously wrong uh, with it. It could be that... Um, because it's been moved around so much, or maybe there's a loose connection somewhere, but it, I have a feeling it has multiple issues. So let's uh, keep digging. I have access to the power supply now, so we can do a quick measurement, see if the voltages at least make sense. And here is the power supply, and we can see all the usual components that we would find in a switching power supply. Nothing unusual going on over here. And uh, I have placed a multimeter all the way all the way out here, and I hope you can you can read it. It might be a little bit blurry because it's probably outside of the focus of the camera a little bit. But nonetheless, we can plug this in now. You have to be very careful. And sometimes optical spectrum analyzers don't like to be powered on on their side. But uh, for the, in this case, uh, we're going to try it anyway. So I'm going to turn it on, and we can measure the outputs of the power supply. So this is the only output section of the power supply, and there's no mention of what voltages they should be, but uh, we can see that there is, they're labeled as ground and voltage. So it looks like there's four different voltages or four banks of voltages, and that the rest is pretty simple. Some common one, doctor, input capacitor, a rectifier, capacitors after the rectifier, mesh switching, main switching, transformer, optocouplers, or some control board, multiple sections, capacitors, filters, yeah, usual stuff. You've seen me talk about switching power supplies so much. So let's go ahead and try and do some quick measurements. Let's see what we get. Let me turn it on. And you know what? <laughs> of course, now it's kind of starting to boot, and then the screen becomes all fuzzy. So it is doing something every time a little bit different than last time. So this is ground. So let's make a measurement here. What voltage do we see here? There you go, that's 12 volts. I think uh, 12 volts is reasonable. And here the ground is in the middle, so I expect a dual power supply, plus or minus perhaps. 12 volts, and on the other side, minus 12 volts. Beautiful. So the power supply on this side looks okay. This has four grounds and four voltages, or four back wires in parallel. What is that? I don't see anything. Oh, interesting. There's nothing. Oh, there it is, five volts. There you go, I'm blocking it, aren't I? Of course I am. Yeah, anyway, I, just, I just had it. There it is. Uh, you might be able to just see it. 5 volts. So, no, the power supplies look good, and they seem to be fairly stable. 12 volts, uh, minus 12 volts, and 5 volts. Typical voltages, and I'm sure they get rectified and uh, regulated in other places and so on. So, nothing. Uh, weird going on over there. So we can move on from the power supply. I think we're going to have to take this apart a step further. I want to get to the core, the main processor board, and just plug and unplug things and uh, see if we can get the, the display to come back to life. And then we can see if it has any other issues. Well, I continue disassembling this. I, uh, like I said before, I think I'm going to rebuild it because I'm pretty sure there are some loose connections somewhere. The LCD screen comes and goes, and uh, so I think it's a little bit of that going on. So I'm going to try that, and this is really not designed for disassembly. And it's not designed for serviceability in a traditional sense. It's very difficult to get to the different components here. I've taken the, the cover off. That's the black cover that you used to see on this side. 
and underneath it I see the main optical grading mirror and the motor that drives it I believe are under there but I can't disassemble this any further from this angle so I have to rotate it around figure out at what point uh, I can get to the motherboard to plug and unplug all the cables and then I like to see if it actually boots up and we can do it to see if we can calibrate it. These cables that I thought were going to GPIB, they're not. They're actually going to the control module of the optical free space optics component, which is all underneath this. Again, totally inaccessible. It looks like a whole module that's just placed in. Uh, not, not very nice. But uh, anyway, let's go ahead and continue on. I'm going to rebuild it. It's really not much of a repair from that point of view if it comes back to life because of that. But nonetheless, we should be able to still see some of the components and hopefully put some optical signal through it and see if we get anything meaningful out of it. Well, I got myself to the motherboard portion, or I should say at least uh, the cards. So this, this section uh, can be folded over. That's what those hinges were for. And uh, if you do it very carefully, you can see the different components and different cards that control various things. So these cables over here control the main uh, motor controller, which then controls the grading mirrors. Uh, this is just powering that uh, optical reference module at the top. This is powering the printer. Uh, and controlling the printer and uh, so what I would do just I'm just gonna plug and unplug everything reset everything clean the connectors with um, the offset uh, cleaner and then once all that put it back together turn it on and see if it comes back to life I would also like to change the backlight of this too but unfortunately I don't have any more backlight uh, strips left so we'll see if maybe hopefully it'll arrive today if it does I'll do that uh, let's uh, continue on so here's something interesting. I took this out. This is one of the DC boards, clearly by the look of all the regulators that you can see on top. And there are so many DC-DC converters, isolated DC-DC converters. So this means this instrument has a lot of different ground planes, most likely and VDD planes. And uh, they're doing a whole bunch of different uh, frequency conversions. So for example, this one, 5 volt comes in, plus or minus 15 comes out. So that's pretty, uh, pretty interesting to see that instead of using, for example, the power supply to do this, they have a whole other board uh, just to create this. And it's very compact, tons of, tons of board in there, each of them with a you know, somewhat different functionality. Uh, there are two of them that control the, the motor, as I said before. And I'm just kind of reseeding them, pulling them out, putting them back in, so we can see if we can get uh, the whole unit to come back online. So I'm making some progress to get to the LCD screen, and uh, this instrument is just a mess to take apart. It's, I have screws everywhere. I hope I can put this thing back together. But also the way it's put together it doesn't really give me the confidence that it was thought out for service. It's just been compact, put together, very difficult to get to the different components. But anyway, so let's, let me show you a couple of other unusual things. So here's the CCFL backlight driver. So here's the DC coming in and the high voltage coming out. Normally these high voltage outputs would go directly to the CCFL lamps themselves, which are on these, inside this LCD module. But in this case, they're taking these out, they're taking it to this little weird board where the rotary encoder is also on there, right over here, and then they just some straight through connections and then this plugs into that. So the high voltage is routed this way and then back into here. And why, why did they do this? It, it looks almost like it's an afterthought that they realize that this doesn't reach and they had to make this custom connection for the longer cables just so that the everything fits together and it's unusual. The other thing that's kind of weird is that the CCFL backlight that has the power coming into it, it also has another connector on it. And this connector then goes into this connector and seems to power part of the LCD driver, which is another really weird thing because now it means I can't get rid of this when I change this to LED backlights because then I still need this board, or unless I find an exact connection between these cables and the cables that go onto this so that we can replace them directly at the source. But it's just, it just seems so unusual and convoluted, uh, the design. And anyway, just the unit itself is just a nightmare to get to the different components, as you saw. But uh, the reason I'm doing this, even though I don't even know if it's fixed by just moving the components around and plugging things in and out and cleaning the contacts, is because it's so dark and dim when it turns on that you can't really see anything. I'd rather get this part fixed so that when we get some errors or when we get it to boot up or something showing up on the LCD, we can actually see what we're doing. So now the next step is uh, put some LED lights in there. So in the process of disassembly of this screen here, so this board is a controller board. I can take that off. It's an NEC-based uh, chipset on there. And this ribbon, two ribbon cables were connected to the controller. And it's interesting to see that it goes into another board where the column or the row drivers, however you want to interpret that, have these die-on ribbons. This is very common. I just haven't seen one broken up into so many sections before. This is a really complicated uh, LCD screen, really, with so many different sections assembled on top of each other. 
whereas most of this is just done on a single board these days. This must be quite old. I don't know if it has a, a date on it. Maybe it does. If I find out, I'll let you know. But anyway, we'll continue on with the disassembly. All right, here we are. I made some modifications, put the backlight back in there. Nothing unusual. I've done this before, so I didn't really want to waste your time on there. And I took out the high voltage transformer that sits on this board. As I mentioned, I have to keep this board because it powers part of the circuitry directly on the LCD as well. But by taking this out, at least it won't generate high voltage here anymore. So then that way it's much safer. And also it won't have unterminated high voltages sitting around for no reason. The other parts of it are not really necessary to keep. So we should be able to put it back together and see if anything shows up on the LCD screen so we can continue looking at this unit. Well, I put it all back together, didn't record the assembly, it was boring anyway, so let's take a look and see what happens. And check it out, so bright, really nice and beautiful backlight now. And uh, it has this unusual animation uh, that's booting. I would much prefer to see a log of some kind as opposed to this weird ball moving back and forth. And what it's doing internally is that it's aligning the grading mirror and it's checking to make sure the grading mirror is rotating and it can register the exact location and calibrating the beginning and end of the grading mirror's rotation and all of that. And I have spoken about exactly how this instrument works in a few of my videos. I did a monochromator project. It's all in there. So I definitely uh, refer you to look at that. And there it is. And look at this. It boots, it boots up and uh, let's see what's going on. So right now I have connected the fiber to the back of the unit. At the back of the unit, there is a reference output. And it's a broadband reference output. So it's not a single laser tone. It's a broadband uh, spectrum. It's um, uh, polychromatic. So let's go ahead and, and, and set the span to the maximum span we can do. No, so the span? Yes, no, that's not what I want to do. Uh, let's say center. There we go. So let's start it at 600 nanometer. And let's stop it at 1.75 micrometer, which is a full range. And uh, yeah, so now it says resolution on Cal. Interesting. I think that's because, there you go, that looks nice. And then the resolution on Cal might be simply because of the fact that, yeah, so here, th that's the reason. So it's trying to do 0 0.07 nanometer, but in reality, it can only get 0 0.081 nanometer because of the number of points I have, which is 2001, and the span that I have. So let's change the resolution to just one nanometer. There you go. And it's 0 0.996 nanometer, which is close enough. So that problem goes away. And as you can see, uh, it looks good. It's, it's a reasonable spectrum. Let's turn on the output. And there we go. As you can see, it is not a single tone. And it's uh, right there at the near the communication bands. It's actually quite higher. No, around the communication bands. No, it's fine. Let me do a marker. Uh, let's say delta marker there. And oh, I can move it all the way over here. And then what are we looking at? Yep, there you go, 1550, 1560, right there on the communication bands. Perfect. So it seems to be OK. Let me raise the marker. And it should be able to do a calibration, I suppose. And it should be able to tell me, uh, let's see. So wavelength calibration. There you go, wavelength calibration reference. So I can press that, execute that. Let's see if that succeeds. So what it's going to do is going to take a look at the light coming in, and it's going to make sure that it's aligned with what it expects. Remember that when I took it apart, I showed you the, the portion of the circuit that had the laser diode assembly in there that went to the back. By the way, there were tons of little things wrong with it. You know, things were not tight enough, things were loose, the connectors weren't connected. I don't know what this instrument went through, but as you can see, so far so good. We are not getting any error messages on it. Let's see what happens. It's calibrating. It's definitely taking its sweet time. And uh, you can always obviously cancel it. You can, you can calibrate this with an external laser. And there's some procedures to do that. I have used one of these before. That's why I'm somewhat familiar with it. And uh, yeah, it's still calibrating. I hope it doesn't fail. I don't want to waste your time watching this, but it's not the most exciting thing to look at. But I can hear the stepper motor and the grading motors and all the alignments going in the background. So it's definitely doing some sweeping, trying to get this calibration working. Jeez, it really does take its time, doesn't it? Ah, there we go. It succeeded. It actually only took another five seconds after I stopped the video. So yeah, it, it succeeded the calibration, which means I'm assuming that it was satisfied with it. There's also an auto align. So let's run that as well. And I think it does the same thing. And I think this is going to take a while too. So I'm going to pause the video again while let's see if it succeeds auto alignment. There we go. And that succeeded as well. So it's all working. Let me put this in repeat mode. There you go. Now it's calibrated a little bit better. So the low levels 
are working. Now, one thing that was a little bit surprising to me was this. So if I go under level, there is a 20 dB attenuator that you can uh, enable. And that attenuator will, actually, I don't know what the attenuation is. I should take that back. So you can either turn the attenuation on and off. And if you turn the attenuation off, you can only put 10 dBm optical light, obviously, into it. Above that, uh, it's not good. I, either damage or just nonlinearity. And then here, 20 dBm if you have the attenuation on. So I suspect we're talking about a 10 dB attenuation. But look what happens when I turn the attenuator on. Turn it on. And what ends up happening is that the noise floor up here just goes up crazy. So at the low wavelength, it almost looks like something goes wrong. I'm not sure. It's not in the data sheet. The fact that it's doing this is normal. That's, that's fine. But this, the fact that this noise floor changes so much, I mean, just compare these two together. The difference is huge. It's much more than 10 dB. So I'm a little bit puzzled by that. Um, and maybe um, I, don't, I don't remember how it's supposed to be, to be honest. But if you guys know, I'd like to hear that, see if that's OK. But this is loaded with a lot of interesting applications. For example, under the applications, you can do DFP laser diode test, FP laser diode LED test, PMD test, which is polarization mode dispersion, uh, optical amplifier test, WDM, wavelength division multiplexing. Very cool. Ferry Perot laser is lots of cool stuff you can measure and you can test and it give you all of that built into it. Definitely capable, fantastic. Uh, it's the A revision. There's now you know, many other revisions after this. But you know, for its compactness and for how awesome it works, I'm really happy with it. And uh, let's try. Uh, Using the printer, <laughs> I wonder if the printer actually works. I haven't tried that yet. Let's see. Um, copy. Is it doing anything? Oh my God, it's printing. I can't believe it actually does that. Uh, the, pa the paper is really, really old, but you can kind of see it's upside down. You can kind of see the plot there. So <laughs> definitely the printer even works. That's, that's crazy. I have to try to see if the floppy works. Well, this is all nice and everything, but I want to measure an actual laser diode. Well. I have quite a few choices. I, this is the optical kind of section of my lab here. So it doesn't get a lot of use these days. But So let's go ahead and plug it into that bottom instrument, the Agilent 83433A, which is a 10 gigabit per second light wave transmitter. The nice thing about it is that it has a laser diode built into it, and it can uh, put out light at 1552.52 nanometer. So I could take the fiber directly connected to that. Actually, I, I can zoom in. There we go. This is the one I'm talking about. Right, as you can see, there's a laser port there. We can connect it up and see what comes out of it. And then we can see if it's actually at the right wavelength. That should be interesting. There we go. Connection made and uh, connected directly to the instrument. So now I can go ahead and enable the laser and see if we see anything uh, remotely close to what we are supposed to see. So let me go ahead and turn the switch on there. And there's the switch. And look at that. There is indeed some light coming out of it. And let's see if the amplitude is correct. I can do a peak search. And there you go, about 7 dBm. That's about right. I didn't clean the fiber very well, but it's usually about 7 to 8 dBm. And it looks good. It's definitely there. It's working. And look at the, look at the wavelength, 1552.2. And what's supposed to come out is around 1552.52. So let's put, yeah, this is, we're looking at this from very far away. So let's set the center to exactly the wavelength that the laser is supposed to have. So 155. Uh, 2.52 nanometer. There you go. And we should change the span a little bit. Interesting, I'm not seeing it. There you go. There you go. I thought it wasn't sweeping anymore. So let's uh, look at the span and we just make the span pretty small. Let's just say 10 nanometer. So we should be looking at it. It should show up right in the middle of the screen there. There you go. Interesting. Now we see two two big flat regions, that's because we're looking at one nanometer steps, which is huge. So we should make the uh, steps much smaller. We can even change the span and make the span smaller. So let's make the span a little bit smaller. Let's make it five nanometer. And we should see now those regions even wider. So it's only five nanometer span. And now what we can do is we can change the resolution from one nanometer to 0.1 nanometer. So 10 times smaller. Let's see what happens. There we go. There is a two tones coming out. Now, this is a little bit unusual. I was expecting one tone. Um, and um, I'm, I know somewhat about semiconductor lasers, but I'm not an expert. So I was going to ask a couple of my friends and see what they think about this. Interesting that I see two tone. I'm not sure if this is because something is going on, something going wrong with this instrument, or is that really supposed to put out two tone? I tried this directly on my wavelength meter, and it doesn't report it as two tones. It reports in a one tone. Now, these two tones are pretty close together. 
So let me uh, turn the markers off. Let me turn that marker off. Now turn the A marker and put it here. And turn the B marker and put it here. And you can see the difference between them is about 1.11 nanometer. And the amplitude difference between them, we can also see, it's going to be a, probably a couple of dB. Let's see what we're dealing with. There you go, about 4.8 dB of difference. So yeah, if uh, it should be an interesting point of discussion here in the comment section of why that is. Is that an issue from the spectrum analyzer, or is this normal? Is there perhaps two modes inside the laser? It's possible that it has two modes, and it's just not extinguishing the modes very well. I'm not sure. Pretty interesting, though. So yeah, I really can't really call this a repair. It's uh, more of just a, you know, a fun little thing to try and disassemble this and reassemble it and take a look. I know you probably wanted to see all the optical bit, but I wanted to try it out, at least to see if we can get it to work before we take it apart, because usually those things, as you know, sometimes you can't even open them because they are purged with a um, non-reactive gas, like a noble gas, or maybe purged with nitrogen, so that oxidization and deterioration of mirrors and things like that wouldn't happen. So opening it sometimes is detrimental or completely ruins the instrument. So that's why I didn't want to do it in this video. But let me know what you think about it and how much more you want to see of the optical spectrum analyzer. I hope you enjoyed the video nonetheless. And again, thank you to my Patreon supporters. You are making all of this possible. And hopefully we will do more. I've got a couple other repairs, and I think you're going to enjoy them. Until next time.